السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We are discussing how scholars would notice and realize that a narration is a fabrication simply by looking at the wording of the narration. So now Sheikh Abdul Fattah Bughadda, rahimahullah, he clarifies one important point, that it's not for everybody, for every person, to just look at the narration, at the text, and then uh, be able to evaluate and be able to claim that this narration is a fabrication. Rather, this year, it's something which only the masters and the experts of the field were able to do. So he says, وَمِمَّا يَنْبَغِ التَّنْبِيهَ عَلَيْهِ هُنَا أَنَّ صَبْرَ الْمَتْنِ كَمَا رَأَيْتَ فِي هَذَا الْكِتَابِ الْمُزَوَّرِ وَفِي الْأَحَادِيثِ الَّتِي قَبْلَهُ لَا يَنْهَضُ بِهِ إِلَّا الْعُلَمَاءُ الْفُحُولُ الْكِبَارِ He say what's um, necessary to clarify at this juncture is that evaluating the matn, the text of the narration, like how you uh, see in this fabricated book, because remember he was speaking about uh, that book of the Jews and how they, uh, this, how they um, made up that uh, letter to say that they don't have to pay any taxes. So he says that um, in this book and in the hadith which he quoted before that, uh, no one will be able to uh, realize it except those ulama who are experts and very senior. الجامعون للعلم رواية ودراية وفقها وتاريخا ونقدا وبصيرة. Those who combine knowledge of the uh, riwayah and diraya, and we spoke about riwayah and diraya in detail. So for the purpose here, we'll just translate it in. Uh, we'll just translate it as علوم الحديث and in the chains of narration وفقها also the um, legal evidence of the narration, the history of the narration, any criticism, and they have full insight. For example, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, Hafiz al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, and Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, min al-Nuqad al-Afdad, rahimahum Allah ta'ala. Individual experts like this, they were the ones who were able to detect when a narration is a fabrication just by looking at the text of the narration. وَقَدْ أَشَارَ الْحَافِظُ بْنُ الصَّلَاحِ فِي مَعْرِفَةِ أَنْوَاعِ عِلْمِ الْحَدِيثِ فِي النَّوْعِ الْحَادِ وَالْعِشْرِينَ مَعْرِفَةُ الْمَوْضُوعِ So he says that Alama ibn Salah rahmallah in his kitab, in his muqaddama, under the 21st chapter, which is regarding mawdu' and narrations, he has indicated ila nahwi ma aslaftuhu to something which is similar to what I have just mentioned. فَقَالَ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى So Alama ibn Salah rahmallah said, وَإِنَّمَا يُعْرَفُ كَوْنُ الْحَدِيثِ مَوْضُوعًا بِإِقْرَارِ وَاضِعِهِ That a narration is known to be a fabrication when the person, he um, uh, admits that it's a fabrication. So all this year we spoke about it, so we'll just go through it until the end. أو ما يتنزل منزلة إقراره وقد يفهمون الوضع من قرينة حال الراوي والمروي وقد وضعت أحاديث طويلة. He said that many lengthy narrations have been fabricated. يشهد بوضعها. How will we know that these are fabricated? ركاكت الفاضيها و the flimsiness of the words and the um, meaning of the narration that will unveil to us and reveal to us that these are fabrications. On the same basis, that uh, looking at the text of the narration and the meanings, الذي قام به الجهابذة المحدثون خير قيام which the expert uh, محدثون have uh, really and very excellently um, taken care of تسقط الدعوة من ادعى أن المحدثين إنما اعتنوا بالنقد الخارجي نقد الإسناد ولم يعتنوا بالنقد الداخلي نقد المتن the claim of those who assert that the muhaddithun, they only would take care of external criticism, and that is naqdul isnad, criticizing and evaluating the sanad, and they did not take care of internal criticism, that is criticizing and evaluating the text, uh, that claim of theirs will be null and void. Rather, they took care of it in the most precise manner. 
Why? Because they were not just doing it as a duty, rather they were doing it with love. لِأَنَّ الْحَدِيثَ كَلَامُ حَبِيبِهِمْ وَقُدْوَتِهِمْ وَنَبِيِّهِمْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ Because the hadith is the speech of the most beloved role model and prophet, the prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. وَفِيهِ بَيَانُ شَرِيعَتِهِمْ وَدِينِهِمْ And what is the hadith? It is explaining to them their religion. فهم أحرص الناس على ضبطه وحفظه وسلامته وأغير الناس وأقوفهم من دخول التقول والتزيد إليه. so they were the, had the most zeal and the greatest fervor in uh, uh, in preserving it and in protecting it and making sure that it is safe and they had the most earnest concern and the greatest fear that any distortions or fabrications or interpolations must be added to it so they took care of the meaning of the narrations like how they took care of the wording of the narration وَإِعْتِنَاؤُهُمْ بِهِ لَهُ حَوَافِزْ لَا تُوجَرْ لِغَيْرِهِ مِنْ كَلَامِ الْبَشَرِ They had greater incentive. So حَوَافِزْ means like an incentive, an initiative. They had greater incentive to look after uh, this, uh, the words of the Prophet وسلم, which is not found for the statement of any other person. So you understand? It's basically the speech of the one who they love the most and who is their role model. And also the speech concerns what is very important for them. And that is so therefore, they have the zeal in preserving it because of this great incentive. How the muhaddithun would consider the, um, the aql, they would consider logic when accepting a narration and when authenticating it. So Sheikh Abdurrahman ibn Yahya al-Mu'allimi rahimahullah in his book Al-Anwar al-Kashifa he mentions that هل راع المحدثون العقل في قبول الحديث وتصحيحه did the muhadithun take into consideration logic when accepting a narration and when authenticating it that they would only accept it and authenticate it if it was logical if it was something which was easy to comprehend and understand with one's mind so Alama Mu'allimi rahimahullah Allah says, نعم, ذلك في أربعة مواطن. Yes, that they considered logic and intellect at four different junctures. In the sama, at the time of hearing the narration. وعند التحديث, at the time when they now are transmitting the narration. وعند الحكم على الرواة, at the time when they have to uh, speak about the narrators. وعند الحكم على الحديث, and at the time when they have to give the final grading on the narration. So it's a lengthy footnote, you can inshallah go uh, through it. But uh, just to show you quick examples of how Sheikh Abdul Fatah Abu Ghutta Rahmullah explains that in the sama, how did they take into consideration aql and logic at the time um, when hearing a narration? How did they base it on intellect? So he says that it's fahsu tilmid al wa'i wa intibaha wa lihal al-shaykh al-rawi. So it means that the student would take into consideration and he would really inspect the sheikh who is narrating it that the person who he him that he's making lots of mistakes in his narrations or if he's con constantly making tadlis he's giving the impression that he heard from shuyu who he did not hear from or he's narrating all kinds of um, uh, weak narrations then they would understand that now we're not going to accept this person to be our uh, sheikh and then he gives um, many examples here to show uh, that uh, how they would really scrutinize a narrator he say they would really go in depth in scrutinizing the sheikh like you know um they would 
a look at his life uh, with a microscope and highly he qabla al akhdi anhu they would scrutinize him thoroughly before they would be uh, would accept him as a sheikh hatta yuqala lahum until it would be said to them aturiduna an tuzawwijuhu are you thinking of getting the sheikh married that you are getting so much knowledge about him you are going into so much detail about his life do you actually want to get him married so then he gives a lot of examples of this here and um, he says wa kathiru min talabati al hadith kanu la يكتبون عن أحد حتى يسألوا عنه أئمة الشأن الذين يعرفون الرواة. Many students of Hadith they would not write a Hadith from any person until they first ask the Imams of Hadith. They would first seek consent from the Imams. Can we go and take Hadith from this person? Then only, only if the uh, if the Imams gave them permission, if experts in the field consented, then only they would go and write from them. So that's on page. 173 where he, um, he explains and gives examples of how they considered intellect when um, uh, evaluating who to take narration from when judging who they must take narration from so this is in the sama then on the page uh, at the end of page 174 he mentions what أما معات المحدثين للعقل في قبول الحديث ورده عند التحديث. Now why would they accept the narration in the first place if it um, if it contradicts uh, عقل that if you look at it, he's saying that في أربعة موات عند السماع وعند التحديث. They would take into consideration عقل at a time when they hear the narration, and then they would take into consideration عقل at a time when they're transmitting the narration. But they can only be taken. Uh, um, uh, they can only be considering logic at a time when transmitting if they did consider logic at a time of sama, isn't it? Because you first hear a narration, then only you can transmit the narration. So why would they accept the narration in the first place? And now that uh, instead, uh, uh, now they would say that no, we're not going to transmit it because um, it goes against logic. So he mentions two reasons for this here. He says that the muhaddisun they just wanted to gather all narrations so that if it's a weak narration, then a person, uh, if he comes and quotes it, they will know that okay, this here is a weak narration. And uh, the second is he says that um, sometimes maybe a muhaddis he had. Um, good thoughts about a particular sheikh. So you can see they would have good thoughts about a sheikh, so they would accept the narration from him. But then they would now think, can I actually code this narration or not? And then they would realize that, no, I cannot code this narration. So that's the how they would consider logic uh, before I, um, transmitting the narration. And then وَعِنْدَ الْحُكْمِ عَلَى الرُّوَى وَعِنْدَ الْحُكْمِ عَلَى الْأَحَادِيثِ So at the end of page 166, uh, 176, he says that وَأَمَّا الْمُحَدِّثِينَ لِلْعَقْلِ عِنْدَ الْحُكْمِ عَلَى الرُّوَى وَعِنْدَ الْحُكْمِ عَلَى الْأَحَادِيثِ فَطَافِحَةٌ بِهَا كُتُبُ الرِّجَالِ وَكُتُبُ الْحَدِيثِ وَالتَّخَارِجِ وَالْعِلَلِ وَالْمَوْضُعَاتِ وَالسِّوَاهَا Then these books, the books of narrators and the, even the books of hadith and the books of takhrij and ilal, and fabrications, these are a fell with such um, incidents to show you how they would consider aqal uh, at a time when transmitting, uh, at a time when grading a narrator, and at a time when passing the final verdict on a narration. So now looking at the top of page 176, so he says, um, so now it's continuing with the words of Alama uh, Mu'allimi Rahimullah. So Alama Mu'allimi Rahimullah, he said that the muhaddithun, they would consider aql, they would consider a person's, inter uh, they would consider intellect and they would uh, look at logic at four instances, at a time of hearing the narration, at a time when transmitting the narration, at a time when uh, passing a verdict on the narrator, and at a, pa at a time when grading the hadith. So now he says, those uh, scholars who are very accurate when they would hear a narration if it seemed far that it could be uh, authentic or if it really was impossible for it to be acceptable, then they would not write it and they would not even memorize it. But if they did memorize it, then they would not quote it. 
So let's see, as you can see, muraatul muhaddithin lil aql inda tahdith. Fa in zaharat maslihatun li dhikri, but they had it in the memory because they knew it off by heart. So yes, if there was a time when maybe if some, uh, they saw that there is some good in quoting it. For example, maybe they wanted to clarify that it's a weak narration or that it's a fabrication. Then they would code that narration, but they would reveal the error or the defect of that narration. Or of the, uh, they would uh, mention the criticism which is upon the narrator. The second point is that Imam Shafi'i rahimullah is mentioned in his risala. Because they so how would you know that whether a narration is acceptable or whether it's a blatant lie is when a muhaddith he quotes something that it's not possible that something like this could have occurred. Or is quoting something and it contradicts that which has been um, established uh, through more concrete evidence. Or it contravenes and it contradicts that which uh, has more indications to uh, be truthful compared to his narration. Then we'll know that this here is a lie. Why? Or oh, it's a, a fabrication. Because how can it be contradicting knowledge? Or how can it be contradicting that which is us, but that which is in the Quran or that which is in the Mashur Sunnah? Or how can it be contradicting that which has been established through something which is more authoritative than it? وقال الخطيب في الكفاية في علم الرواية باب وجوب الطراح المنكر والمستحيل من الأحاديث. So علما خطيب رحمه الله he put this chapter heading in his al kifaya the chapter on the compulsion of discarding munkar narrations and those narrations which are impossible. That it's impossible that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم could have uttered such words. وفي الرواة جماعة يتسامحون عند السماع وعند التحديث. And from the narrators, there are those who are lenient or they were easy going at a time when hearing the narration and at a time when transmitting that narration. لكن الأئمة بالمرصاد للرواة. But the imams, they are sitting in ambush for every narrator. فلا تكاد تجد حديثا بين البطلان. إلا وجدت في سنده واحدا أو اثنين أو جماعة قد جرحهم الأئمة. So he says that generally it's not you're not going to find lots of examples like this where it's something which contradicts knowledge and the entire synod is going to be authentic. Yes, there could be um, that uh, those instances where a fabricator has made up that synod, but then. The scholar, he will notice that this person is the fabricator. So like that, whenever you have a text, majority of the times, uh, if you have a text which is very clearly uh, impossible or it's very um, emphatically, it's, uh, it's, it's um, baseless, then you will find in the Senate, there will be one person or you will find two people or maybe you will find even a great group of people who the scholars have criticized. والأئمة كثيرا ما يجرحون الراوي بخبر واحد منكر جاء به. Many times scholars would criticize a narrator just because of bringing one narration which is munkar. Because a narrator just I mentioned, I quoted one narration which is uh, so obvious that it's a fabrication, scholars would criticize the narrator. فضلا عن خبرين أو أكثر لفلون two or three narrations ويقولون للخبر الذي تمتنع صحته أو تبعد منكر and they would uh, mention and they would grade that narration which seems so far-fetched uh, um, to be authentic or which really was um, uh, not authentic they would call that a منكر narration or they would use a word like باطل وتجد ذلك كثيرا في تراجم الضعفاء وكتب العلل والموضوعات you will find this here a lot in uh, the books on the entries of uh, on the books which list uh, weak narrator or on the books which uh, discusses hidden defects or on the books which um, talks about 
فبجيشنز والمتثبتون لا يوثقون الراوي حتى يستعرضوا حديثه وينقدوه حديثا حديثا so those scholars were very accurate and precise they would not authenticate a narrator until they inspect each and every narration of his. So we'll go through narration by narration. In fact, when you do Muqaddamah ibn Salah, when you study, how would scholars evaluate the memory of a narrator? Because you can't take the memory and put it on the scale and say, okay, this person has a good memory and that person has a weak memory. So how would they determine whether a person has a good memory or not? They would evaluate, uh, they would scrutinize and look at each and every narration of his. And from there, they would see that if he's quoting narrations, which are all um, generally in conformity with what other scholars quote, then they would say, okay, this person remembers well. He's not making mistakes mistakes because what he is quoting is the same things that the imams are quoting but if they find that he is quoting things which no one else has quoted and he comes up with new things then they would regard his narrations as shad or munkar then he says and as for authenticated narration uh, authenticating narrations the muhaddithun would pay more concern to this and they would take more caution. Naam, laysa kullu man hukiya anhu tawthiqun aw tashihun mutathabitan. Yes, we understand that it's not every uh, uh, rawi who has been graded as reliable or every narration which has been authenticated. It's most definitely established from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Walakinna al-arif, but that person who knows al-mumaris, you may give us how ulai min ulaiq. A scholar, an expert, he will be able to differentiate and he will know that these, this year can definitely not be the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, Akhdu Fata Abu Ghudda now says, وَهَذِهِ إِشَارَةٌ عَابِرَةٌ فِي الْمَوْضُوعِ This is something which I just mentioned in passing, which is related to the topic. وَيُمْكِنُ أَيُّ تَوَسَّعَ فِي الْمَوْضُوعِ in the tawajjuh ilayhi. If you really want to pay concern, uh, uh, if you really want to focus on this topic, then you can go into more detail about it. So that was the fourth method. And now the fifth method was عِلْمُ الْجَرْحِ وَالتَّعْدِيلِ The fifth method. Um, strategy to make sure that there are no fabrications was that the scholars of hadith they came up with the science which is known as ilm al jarh wa ta'dil critiquing and approving a narrator so first he defines what is al jarh wa ta'dil so he says al jarh lughatan that what is al jarh at ta'thir fi al jism bi sayf aw nahwihi it is making a mark having an impact on the body so whether it is with a sword so, you know, if you take a sword, you'll scratch a person or you might even cut a person. So like this here on the body, you're um, uh, leaving a mark. We say if in Aunahwi, or maybe it's not with a uh, sword, maybe with a stick. So if you take a stick and you scratch it against a person, there might be a mark on his body. So this is what is called Al-Jarh. So this is the literal uh, and original meaning of Al-Jarh. Then it was used for two things. One is for any defect of a person. So if a person has any defect compared to, what, uh, 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 compared to another human being, they would use the word Jarh. Or, or if he is deficient, Anil Maqam is Sabiyil. be used for any defect and for any uh, uh, deficiency in a person. So that's the lateral meaning. Wastilahan, the technical meaning of uh, jarh is wasful hafiz naqid li rawi bima yaqtadhi radda riwayatihi aw tadhifaha. It is where a hafiz who is an expert, he describes a narrator in such a way that it would necessitate that you reject uh, uh, his narrations or that you grade him as weak. So when using the word, you can either, either use it from Thulathi Mujarrad or you can use it from Mazid Fihi. So you can say Jaraha bi or you can say Jaraha from Bab Taf'il bi Tashdidiha lil Kathrati wal Mubalaga to show that he is he really scrutinized this person. You want to uh, uh, exaggerate and you want to, uh, um, if you want to uh, really 
emphasize that this person has uh, criticized that uh, narrated and you use the word jarraha. So that's the first word, al-jarh. Then the second word, al-ta'adil. So what's the meaning of ta'adil? Uh, the um, uh, the, the lughwi meaning is tazkiyatul insan wa madhuhu. So exonerating a person and praising a person. So exonerating tazkiyah means when you say that this person is free from fault. So uh, claiming that a person is free from fraud, that, that, that is one thing. Uh, but madhuhu um, is that not only you are claiming that he's free from fault, you are actually praising the person. So you're going now to another extent and you are saying that this person is so good. And you attribute him, you describe him to be someone who is reliable and he is mo moderate in all his affairs. So this here is the linguistic meaning. As for the technical meaning, so it is where a hafiz who is an expert, he describes a narrator in such a way that it will necessitate that this person is free from any criticism or any defect in his deen or in his methodology. So a wasful hafiz in naqid, this here is, uh, you can see it's linked to that. Or he is approving of the narrator, wa qabula riwayatihi. Or he is accepting his narrations. Qal al-hakim fi ma'arifati ulum al-hadith. Imam Hakim rahimullah is mentioned in his book, Ma'arifa ulum al-hadith. An naw'u thamin ashara min ulum al-hadith. The 18th chapter of ulum al-hadith is ma'arifatu al-jarh wa ta'adil. So he says that, there are actually two separate sciences. The one is the ilm of jarah, where you, where you only um, criticize narrators, those who were not uh, on the level, uh, they were not suitable to transmit a hadith. And the other science is that where you approve of those narrators who really were, um, uh, they were really deserving and they were really competent enough to quote a hadith. Every each of the two is a complete and independent science on its own. So he says that this year is the fruits of this whole ilm of ulum uh, al-hadith, and it is the greatest staircase for it. It's a complete independent science. It is not linked with uh, chapters which he mentioned earlier in his book. So the author of Kashf al-Zunun, who, as you know, is Haji Khalifa Mustafa ibn Abdullah. He's famously known as Haji Khalifa. He said, علم الجرح والتعديل هو علم يبحث فيه عن جرح الرواتي وتعديلهم بألفاظ مخصوصة. It is a science where you search for any defect of a narrator or of approving of a narrator. But what special words? And then uh, you know the different levels of those words. So what does this, those words denote upon? So this is what Ilm al is basically. That you go through the books, you see that, okay, this uh, scholar is mentioning about that narrator, Salih. And another scholar is mentioned, Thiqa. So now, uh, does Salih equal to Thiqa? So the different levels of it. So you're looking at, um, at the, uh, uh, the different levels of the words and what does it necessitate? If you say say al hifz, then what does it mean? If you say maqbul, what does it mean? The al jarh wa ta'adil min al kitab wa sunnah. So now he's mentioning that the roots of jarh wa ta'adil, the origin of it is in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Mashru'iyat al jarh wa ta'adil mu'assalatun fi nusus al kitab wa sunnah. The, uh, um, the, the legislation of al jarh wa ta'adil, it's firmly rooted in text of the Quran and the Sunnah. So he says that, look, for example, this verse of the Quran, verse number six of Surah Hujurat, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu in ja'akum fasiqum binaba'in fatabayyanu. When a person who is a fasiq, a transgressor, brings uh, news to you, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning fatabayyanu. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned fil ahmaqil 
mutaa, a, a, a foolish person who has been obeyed, bi'sa akhul ashira wa bi'sa bnul ashira. So you can see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is making jarah, he's criticizing a person. Why? Because of a valid reason. Imam Bukhari, rahmullah, has transmitted this in his sahih. Waminha fit ideal, he's saying that look from Quran, you can see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has approved of some people, and the Prophet has also accredited uh, some individuals, and this proves the science of ta'adil where muhaddithun would approve and accredit a narrator. So he says, Qawlu ta'ala wa sabiquna al-awwaluna min al-muhajirin wa al-ansar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making ta'adil of the sahaba. Wal-ladhina taba'uhum bi ihsan in al-natabi'in, etc. Radiyallahu anhum wa radu'an. Wa qawlu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, في عبد الله بن عمر رضي الله عنه إن عبد الله رجل صالح. so the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم referred to عبد الله بن عمر as a صالح which shows the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم made تعديل of him. وقوله صلى الله عليه وسلم في خالد بن الوليد نعم عبد الله وأخو العشيرة خالد بن الوليد. so here the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is approving of خالد بن الوليد. وسيف من سيوف الله زي سواد from the swords of Allah سبحانه وتعالى سله الله على الكفار والمنافقين Allah سبحانه وتعالى has let him lose on the kuffar and on the munafiqin likewise the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم has mentioned upon the conqueror of Istanbul and the areas which surround it and it refers to Muhammad ibn al Muhammad al Fatih this year was a approximately a thousand years before its conquest. لَتُفْتَحَنَّ الْقُسْطَنْتِنِيَّةِ فَلَنِعْمَ الْأَمِيرُ أَمِيرُهَا So the Prophet is using words of approval. That the, first, the Amir who is going to conquer that year, he's such a good leader. وَلَنِعْمَ الْجَيْشُ ذَلِكَ الْجَيْشُ and what a good army that is. So you can see the Prophet Sallallahu made ta'adil of the leader also and of the entire army. وَمَا رَوَاهُ الْبُخَارِيُّ فِي صَحِيحِهِ عَنِ الْحَسَنَ الْبَصْرِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا عَمْرُ بْنُ ثَغْلِبْ قَالَ أَتَى النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَالْ So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, some wealth came to him. فَأَعْطَى قَوْمًا وَمَنَعَ آخِرِينَ So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave some companions and he did not give others. فَبَلَغَهُ أَنَّهُمْ عَتَبُ So it um, reached the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that they are blaming the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for not giving them also portion of the wealth. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inni la rajul wa ada'u rajul. I give some people and I don't give some people. Walladhi ada'u ahabbu ilayya min alladhi u'ti. But those who I do not give, they are more beloved to me than those who I give. So I'm giving those uh, um, who are not so beloved to me and I'm depriving those who are very beloved to me. U'ti aqwaman lima fi qulubihim min al wal halay'i. The reason why I'm giving some people is because in their hearts, they are not firm in the Islam. They have this restlessness, jaza' wal halay'i. They have this uneasiness. وَأَكِلُ أَقْوَامًا إِلَى مَا جَعْلَهُ اللَّهُ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ إِلَى مَا جَعْلَ اللَّهُ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مِنَ الْغِلَى وَالْخِيرِ And other people, I am confident enough in them. So I just hand them over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in their hearts contentment and so much goodness. From among those people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in their hearts ghina and khair is Amr ibn ثغلب. So then عمر when he had the say he said ما أحب أن لي بكلمة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حمر نعم that I would not love to have red camels the best conveyances in exchange of these words of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. So the fact that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم approved of him and made تعديل of him this was more beloved to him than all the material things of this world. وقوله صلى الله عليه وسلم في تزكية القرون الثلاثة. Likewise, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم approved and made تزكية of the first three generations. And he said, خيركم قرني ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم. This year is narrated by Imam Bukhari رحمه الله and Imam Muslim رحمه رحمه الله. وقوله إن خير تابعين رجل يقال له ويس. So with regards to ويس قرني, you can see the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is approving him. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم made تعديل of him.
وإليك ثلاثة نماذج اجتمع فيها الجرح ثم تعديل. So he says now I'm going to present to you three examples. In one incident, in one text, you're going to have first criticism, and then after that you're going to get ta'adil. So it's uh, in one incident, it's com a combination of both al-jarh and al-ta'adil. So he says, Ahaduha mimma nazala ta'adil fihi min Allahi ta'ala fil Qur'an al-Kareem. The first is there's ta'adil, there's accrediting, there's approval from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an. Wathnani minha min al-sunnat al-mutahara. And two of the incidents I established from the sunnah. جاء تعديل فيهما من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. In the letter two incidents, the تعديل is from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. وذلك خير دليل وتمثيل. This is the best proof and it's the most precise example that you can give على مشروعية الجرح والتعديل to prove that the whole concept of الجرح والتعديل. والله يهدي إلى سواء السبيل. And Allah سبحانه وتعالى is the one who guides to the straight path. روى البخاري ومسلم في صحيحي ما عن الصحابي الجليل زي ابن أرقم رضي الله عنه قال كنت في غزات هي غزوة بني المصطلق فسمعت أي بعد قفولهم منها so زي ابن أرقم is saying that we're in this battle of um, in a غزوة بني المصطلق and I heard after they were returning Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sulul that he's telling the people لا تنفقوا على من عند رسول الله حتى ينفضوا من حوله وَلَئِنْ رَجَعْنَا مِنْ عِنْدِهِ لَيُخْرِجَنَّ الْأَعَزُّ مِنْهَا الْأَذَلِ Don't spend anything upon the Prophet ﷺ. And also when we return back to Medina, we are going to be the ones who are honored and we're going to drive them all out of Medina. So Zaid ibn Arqam here, the CEO, so he says that I told it to my paternal uncle. And the reason why he told it to his paternal uncle, وَذَلِكَ لِسُغَى رِسِنِّهِ إِذْ كَانَ غُلَامًا He was still a young boy. So of course... Um, he did not have um, the audacity to go and mention it to the Prophet وسلم, so he just told it to his paternal uncle. وسلم, so his paternal uncle then conveyed this to the Prophet وسلم, and he's saying, you know what? That Abdullah ibn Ubay is uttering this kind of words. He's telling and um, instigating people and telling them that they must not spend any money, they must not give any financial help. And when they go back to Medina, they're going to drive you all out. So the Prophet ﷺ, he wanted to hear it directly from me, so he summoned me and he um, uh, and I uh, told it to him. Then the Prophet ﷺ called for Abdullah ibn Ubay and all his companions. فَحَلَفُوا مَا قَالُوا They took an oath. They were munafiks, so for them it was um, uh, no big deal to swear it, uh, and to take custom on the name of Allah Ta'ala. So they said they did not say this. فَكَذَّبَنِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمُ وَصَدَّقَهُمْ So the Prophet ﷺ, he just believed in me and he believed in what they told him. فأصابني هم لم يصبني مثله قط. I became so worried about this that I was never overtaken by such a worry like this before. فجلست في البيت. Why? Because now the Prophet, uh, uh, um, I was uh, overtaken by such grief because now the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم thinks that I am a liar. فقال لي عمي ما ما أنكل إنه أصلاً يسألني ويقول لي ما أردت إلى أن كذبك رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وما قتك what did you do that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Munafiqun. إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ The verses لَيُخْرِجَنَّ الْأَعَزُ مِنْهَا الْأَذَلِ So then فَبَعَثَ عَلَيَّ النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم فَقَرَأَهَا عَلَيَّ the Prophet وسلم, then called for me and the Prophet وسلم, recited all these verses to me. So in the initial stages, the Prophet وسلم, discredited him. And now uh, the Prophet وسلم, said, In Allah Qad Saddaqaka Ya Zayd, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has believed in what you said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has approved your statement. And in this way, the Prophet وسلم, made ta'adil and accepted Zayd radiallahu anhu. So you can see that yeah, it's in one incident you have a combination of both. Um, Jarah also and Ta'adil also. The second incident, Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, Rahimahullah, they also narrated from Udban or Udban, however you want to pronounce it, Udban ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu, the lengthy narration that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa then stood up and he started to perform salah and people all uh, stood up behind him and everyone from that vicinity came and um, 
uh, they all gathered in the house and uh, it was quite a great group of people. And then فَقَالَ قَائِلٌ مِّنْهُمْ So in the footnotes, uh, Shaykh Abdul Fattah Abu explains that it was not the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who said it, rather it was فَقَالَ قَائِلٌ مِّنْهُمْ It was one person said أَيْنَ مَالِكُ بْنُ دُخْشُنْ So someone said, that, so now you can see they're making jarah of him. ذَلِكَ رَجُلٌ مُنَافِقٌ لَا يُحِبُّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَ That person is a munafiq. He does not love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him la taqul thalika. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is making ta'adil. So this is the example. Shaykh Abdul Fattah Abu Qutay is showing you. Look, there's first jarah. Now there's ta'adil. There's ta'adil. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said ala tarahu qad qal. Don't you see that he says la ilaha illa Allah yuridu bi thalika wajh Allah. And he wants the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa imna Allah qad harrama ala nari man qal la ilaha illa Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made forbidden upon the fire that person who says la ilaha illallah hoping for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third example, Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, rahmahumullah, they also have narrated it in their sahihs, and it's a famous incident of uh, Tabuk. So Ka'b ibn Malik, that lengthy incident, where, um, the qissa of uh, his repentance. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, while he, um, he was sitting amongst the people in Tabuk, ma fa'ala Ka'b ibn Malik? What, where's Ka, uh, Kaab ibn Malik? What is he up to? How come he's not here? So a person from Banu Salima said, Ya Rasulullah, habasahu burdahu wa nazaru fi atafayhi. In the footnotes, they explain basically his garments, his um, worldly possessions has uh, kept him behind. So this here is jarah. It's criticism against him. فَقَالَ لَهُ مُعَاذُ بْنُ جَبَلْ بِئْسَمَا قُلْتَ And this is what we should do when people also make ghiba in our presence. That, um, if you have this, you say, بِئْسَمَا قُلْتَ How bad what you are saying? وَاللَّهِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مَا عَلِمْنَا عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا خَيْرًا We don't know anything except good of Ka'ab radiallahu anhu. فَسَكَتَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ So in the footnote, Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghuddah says, وَسُكُتُ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ إِقْرَارٌ لِمُعَاذَ عَلَى إِنْكَارِهِ The Prophet صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ is making taqreer, he's approving uh, what uh, Mu'adha radiallahu anhu has uh, said. So that shows it's from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So after a jarah, there was ta'adil. هذا والأسان السابقان. So now Shaykh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghuddah mentions that the previous two, uh, two strategies, which was نقد الرواء and صبر متن الحديث, where, uh, which was mentioned that they criticize narrators and they inspect uh, the text of the narration. هُمَا عِمَادُ مَا أَسْمَوْهُ عِلْمَ الْجَرْحِ وَالتَّعْدِيلِ These are the pillars of this new science that they developed, which is known as عِلْمُ الْجَرْحِ وَالتَّعْدِيلِ So you understand, the previous two methods that he mentioned previously, um, that the muhaddithun uh, came up with the strategy of inspecting and evaluating and scrutinizing the narrators, and they also uh, checked um, and analyzed the text of the narration. This forms the basis of this new science, عِلْمُ الْجَرْحِ وَالتَّعْدِيلِ Mizani Rijal. This year is the knowledge of weighing uh, the narrators, of now really checking the narrators. So now he's mentioning all the different things you look at of a narrator in the science of Al-Jarhu wa Ta'adil. So fi nafsihi, his personal life, fi marwiyati, all his narrations, his teachers, his students, how reliable he is, how trustworthy he is, his memory, how much he forgets, how retentive he is, how much mistakes and how many, how often he mixes up narrations, how weak he is, how strong he is, how he was when he heard the narration, how he is when he transmits the narration, how he was when he was young, when he was middle age, when he became older, when he was at home, when he was on a journey, all the good that he said about him, the good actions that he would do, the sunnah that he would hold on to, if there was any bid'ah that he uh, came up, up with, if there's any criticism against him, or even any um, uh, 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 nasty remarks against him, small uh, uh, issues against him, or anything where it's um, anything which he does, which goes against Murua as dignity. Uh, uh, he does not act in a dignified way. If there's any negatives of about him, or if there's any fabrications, so totally scrutinize every aspect of his life.
هنا هذا is no easy science. So Sheikh Abdul Fatah Abu Ghuda says, خطورة الجرح والتعديل وآفات إما. This is such a dangerous science. And this is something which we should also take into consideration when speaking against uh, scholars of today. That you know, sometimes a person, shaitan, he got so many years of experience, isn't it? So it makes a person feels that they're upholding deen, they're defending deen by wagging the, uh, the tongues against uh, scholars. But meantime, he doesn't know that he's uh, busy digging his own grave. He's going deeper and deeper into the fire of Jahannam. So it's a very dangerous science. So he says, وَهُوَ عِلْمٌ صُعْبٌ عَصِرٌ If you have a habit of uh, criticizing and writing against scholars, then write this on your wall. That even the science of Jarhu Tadil, if you want to justify it by the, uh, the science of Jarhu Tadil, so in all along scholars were criticizing others, then take into consideration this, that it is something which is really difficult. It's something which where a person slips a lot. And when a person slips, then it becomes very dangerous. So you can see Mazlak, a person slips. It's not that he's just slip and he'll break his arm. No, he'll slip and he'll slide into the fire. So now it's so dangerous. What a dangerous science it is. وَلِذَا قَالَ الْإِمَامِ بْنُ دَقِيقَ الْعِيدِ فِي كِتَابِ الْقِتْرَاحِ فِي بَيَانِ الْإِسْتِلَاحِ So he mentions that Ibn Daqiq al-Eid, Rahmullah, he mentioned in this book of his, الْبَابُ الثَّامِنْ فِي مَعْرِفَةِ الضُعَفَاء وَهَذَا الْبَابِ الْبَابُ الْجَرْحِ This chapter of criticizing narrators, تَرْخُلُ فِيهِ الْآفَةُ مِنْ وُجُوهُ there are many calamities which come uh, to it from various angles. So mean wujuhin khamsa. From five different angles, you can see there are problems which come up with this year. Ahaduha, the first, and this year is the worst, al-kalamu bisabab al-hawa. When a person speaks against another a person just because of his own ego wal or because of um, ulterior motives with tahamul, or maybe because of prejudice or biasness. When a person criticizes another person, why? Because that person has different aqeedah. So all along, when a person had different aqeedah, then scholars would either, either make takfir of the person, they would say that he's a kafir because his aqeedah differs. Or they would say that he is from a group that is astray. So they would make tabdi'ah. They would regard him as a, a person of bid'ah. Um, they would uh, regard him as astray. So that's the second reason why they would criticize a narrator. الْإِخْتِلَافُ الْوَاقِعَ بَيْنَ الْمُتَصَوِّفَ وَأَصْحَابِ الْعُلُومِ الظَّاهِرَةِ So you know the Sufis, they look at ulum al isn't it? And the Fuqaha, they look at ulum al -zahira. So because of this, sometimes those who are looking at ulum al the Sufis, they will criticize the muftis. And sometimes the muftis will criticize the Sufis. So this led to hatred, which actually caused some of them to criticize and condemn others. Then you can see there's words which are, he's not quoting now from Al-Iqtira. So he puts three dots to show that he's leaving out some portions. Warabi'uha, the fourth reason when a person will criticize another person, um, illegally or in a uh, way that is not justified الكلام بسبب الجهل بالعلوم ومراتبها والحق والباطل منها when a person doesn't know so if a person doesn't know and then he thinks when a, uh, the, uh, uh, the person who is doing something uh, correct he thinks that the person is doing wrong and therefore he criticizes him وخامسها الخلل الواقع بسبب عدم الورع والأخذ بالتوهم والقرائن التي قد تخ, uh, تتخلفه the fourth reason why a person would criticize another is maybe if there's any other um, a reason which contradicts piety or maybe a person just has uh, unnecessary doubts or maybe some other factor. So for that, he will criticize a narrator. So he's mentioning because of the difficult that all of these conditions can combine it um, uh, can be combined. So now what's the meaning of the statement? So Sheikh Abdul Fatah Abu Ghuta explains it. Because remember he's leaving out words. So that is why he needed to clarify to you what Alama Ibn Daqiq al-Eid is saying. That because it's so difficult to really 
uh, be protected and pure and safe from all of these calamities which comes into the science of criticizing narrators. It becomes so severe and so dangerous to speak against narrators. So exactly the same thing. He explains again. Because those who make this care, the scholars who approve of narrators, uh, because of it being so, um, because of it being so uh, random, or because of it being so minimal, um, that they will actually combine all of these kind of qualities, minal adala, so qualities such as being trustworthy, being moderate, wal i'tidal, wal insaf, being just, wal ilm, having true knowledge, wal taqwa, wal wara, having piety, wal salamati minal hawa, being free from the ego, wal mail, having inclinations, wal hasad, jealousy, wal kids, plotting, wal adawa, enmity, then dot 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 means etc etc so because the very few muhaddithun very few uh, of those who approve of narrators will have a combination of all of these qualities so um, that is why it becomes so uh, dangerous and therefore alama ibn daqiq al eid he said that a'radu al muslimin hufratun min hufar al nar this is something we always remember that the honor of a muslim is a pet from the pets of the fire it's from the fire of Jahannam. That means if a person is to criticize or take away the honor of another Muslim, then he will fall into the fire. So he says, وَقَفَ عَلَى شَفِيرِهَا طَائِفَةً مِنَ النَّاسِ There are two groups of people who are standing right on the edge uh, of the fire. And who are those two people? Two groups of people, the muhaddithun and the hukam. The muhaddithun, because they have to criticize other narrators. And uh, so if they have to criticize for ulterior motives, they will fall into the fire. Well, hukam, because they are passing judgment against another person. So maybe a person is not a thief, but this uh, the judge passes a judgment and now he's treated as a thief. Maybe he's not a person who drank wine, but because of the judgment of uh, the hakim, now he's considered as a person who involved himself in such a, a great son. So therefore, they are the ones who are standing right at the edge. And if they have to make a mistake, they will slip headlong into the fire of Jahannam. Can you see what a dangerous science it is? So Hafiz Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Salih al-Shami mentioned in his kitab, Uqud al-Juman fi Maraqib Abi Hanifa al-Nu'man, so this is your aspirantah with the tahqiq of the son of Shaykh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda. So after uh, quoting the statement of Ibn Daqiq al-Eid, he now uh, shortens it even more. And he says, وَلَيْسَ الْحُكَّامُ وَالْمُحَدِّثُونَ السَّوَعَ That both of them are not even equal. The hukam, the judges, and the muhadithun are not even equal. فَإِنَّ الْحُكَّامَ أَعْذَرُ Because the hukam, they have an excuse. لِأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَحْكُمُونَ إِلَّا بِالْبَيِّنَةِ الْمُعْتَبَرَةِ They, at least when they are passing judgment, they have some concrete evidence in front of them. So they are not so much on the edge. But the muhadithun, uh, the, the muhadithun وَغَيْرُهُمْ يَعْتَمِدُ مُجَرَّدَ النَّقْلِ They are basing it entirely on what has been transmitted to them. So they are more vulnerable. They are closer to the edge. They make one mistake, they fall into the fire. وَهُوَ إِسْتِدْرَاكُ So now Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda, he comments on the statement and he said, وَهُوَ إِسْتِدْرَاكُ حَسَنٌ رَفِيعٌ This is a beautiful comment that he passed. يَزِيدُ فِي بَيَانِ خُطُورَةِ مَزَالِقِ الْجَرْحِ وَالتَّعْدِيلِ Which increases in, um, in, ex in explaining how dangerous it is to and how easy it is to fall when doing jarah and ta'dil. And he says, therefore, Imam Sakhawi rahimullah is mentioned in Fathul Mughir under the chapter of thiqat uh, and du'afa while speaking about the dangers of a jarah and ta'dil. So, like how we say that we want to follow scholars of the past, and that is why we keep speaking against great scholars. So, he says, oh, the one who is diving into this, the one who is um, involving himself in this, al muqatafi fihi, the one who is following the method, uh, the footsteps of those who came earlier. So uh, be cautious, wahadur, min gharazin, from ulterior motives, or hawan, of following your own lust and ego, yahmiluka kullum min huma, that ulterior motives or your own ego will cause you Al-Tahamul, to be prejudiced, well, in Hiraf, or even to go completely astray, Watarkil insaf, not to be just, or will it try, well, if they actually falsely uh, accuse a person. 
So if tira against a person, that means you're fabricating against a person, you're falsely accusing a person. فَذَلِكَ شَرُّ الْأُمُورِ الَّتِي تَرْخُلْ عَلَى الْقَائِمِ بِذَلِكَ الْآفَةُ مِنْهَا When you falsely accuse a person, then this is the worst thing which you can ever do. وَالْمُتَقَدِّمُونَ سَالِمُونَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ مِنْهُ الْقَالِبًا More often, the earlier scholars would be free from this year. مُنَزَّهُونَ عَنْهُ they would not uh, have uh, followed their ego or follow their own uh, desires. They were pure, euphoric deity because they had such great deen. But this year, now remember, Al Masakhawi is mentioning this year 500 years ago. So he says, this is in contrast to the latter day scholars. Many times you'll see the mutaakhirun. They uh, have uh, criticized earlier uh, uh, narrators, and uh, uh, the Ahluddin uh, would uh, and um, would uh, save themselves from criticizing uh, narrators because of those reasons. So it contradicts the methodology of those who are pious and religious and their methodologies. فَالْجَرْحُ وَتَعْدِيلُ خَطَرٌ So Alama Saqawi is saying that this is very dangerous. لِأَنَّكَ إِنْ عَدَّلْتَ بِغَيْرِ تَثَبُّتٍ if you are going to approve of a, a narrator with no valid reason, then you are establishing something in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is not established. So it will be feared that you will be entered in a group of people who quote a narration whilst knowing that it is a lie. Uh, so that means you will be inclu uh, included in the list of fabricators. If you have to falsely and incorrectly uh, approve of a narrator, because now you are saying that you, whatever narrations this person has quoted, you can accept it. So if a person can accept it, what if this person is actually a liar? Now people are going to be accepting lies, isn't it? So by approving a person like that, the person who approved him, he will be getting the sun. So you can see how dangerous it is. If you criticize without any caution, then now you are criticizing a Muslim from something which he is free from. You are describing him with such a evil description. He will have to be the one who will be uh, the this grace of it forever and ever. So on your words, people are going to now be criticizing that narrator. And this person, that narrator will now be uh, dishonored. He will be disgraced. It's all because of your words. فَالْجَرْحُ خَطَرٌ So this year is very dangerous. أَيُّ خَطَرٍ How dangerous it is. فَإِنَّ فِيهِ مَعَ حَقِّ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَرَسُولِهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ سَلَمْ حَقَّ آدْمِيٍ That here you have the rights of Allah Ta'ala. And why the rights of Allah Ta'ala? Because it's the deen of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. And the rights of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Why? Because it's the words of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Combined with it, you also have the rights of another person. So imagine if you have to do this incorrectly. Then, how are you going to answer in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It is so dangerous. وَقَالَ الْحَافِظُ الْإِمَامُ بْنُ الصَّلَاةِ فِي كِتَبِ مَعْرِفَةِ وَاعِ عِلْمِ الْحَدِيثِ أَنَّوْ عُلْحَادِ وَالسِّتُونَ مَعْرِفَةُ السِّقَاتِ وَالضُعَافَ مِنْ رُوَاتِ الْحَدِيثِ So Alam ibn Salai mentions under this chapter, الْكَلَامُ فِي الرِّجَالِ جَرْحًا وَتَعْدِيلًا جُوِّزَ سُونًا لِلشَّرِيعَةِ It has been permitted just to save God and protect the Sharia. وَنَفْيًا لِلْخَطَئِ وَالْكَذِبِ مِنْ عَنْهَا to remove any mistakes or any outright lies from it. So just like how it is permissible for uh, um, those uh, for, for witnesses in a court to speak against another person, so they will come and they will say that this person done that sin. In the same way, it is permissible for narrators to also criticize and speak against to uh, against another person. Does this apply also to scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah when people ask if you can read and take from him or not, since many things are said about him? So firstly, you're going to have to, um, if you go a few a few uh, pages back, you will see that Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghuddah is actually, uh, he actually praised Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmallah, isn't it? In the very beginning, what did we read? We read that, he's saying that uh, uh, in the very opening paragraph, he's saying that, um, 
وفي الاحاديث التي قبله لا ينهذ به الا العلماء الفحول الا العلماء الفحول الكبار الجامعون للعلم روايه ودرايه وفقها وتاريخا ونقدا وبصيره he saying such great scholars who combine all of this knowledge of the chains of narrations of the texts of narrations of the history they have so much insight kalimam ibn jarir al-tabari wal hafiz al-khatib al-baghdari wa shaykh al-islam ibn taymiyah so you can see this watch of the fatabu khuda mentioned on 171 so if you are absolutely sure uh, that uh, and then if you go read al-radd al-wafir etc so firstly you need to uh, decide on what basis you criticizing him um once you form your opinion then for the sake of deen if you criticize him it's fine but if you just do it because of like you, you can see when he's speaking here because of hawan or uh, if you're just uh, criticizing him without any concrete evidence you don't even know why you're criticizing him uh, whether uh, because now you got scholars on both sides you got scholars who are praising him so much you can see how sheikh uh, sheikh abdul fatah bukhda is no small person from all he's he, uh, he got scholars of 1400 years and he chose these few names so it shows how much regard he had for him so uh, um whether you're regarding him as a scholar or not I will first depend on that if you really regard him to be absolutely a stray now if you criticize him then you're doing it for din so it's just like how uh, uh, every other narration has also be uh, every other narrator who is weak has also been criticized that is how you criticize him so we can talk about ibn taymiyah easily without exaggeration for over 10 hours but this is not the topic about uh, about him so uh, statements he made whether things were accurate about him whether things are not accurate whether his statements could be uh, interpreted in which way they could be interpreted but uh, the short answer is that when people ask you about ibn taymiyah uh, it's actually discussion is better to ask on a group like you know last week because now we're trying to uh, uh, hasten the kitab and now we get tied down with this uh, um, but if, basically when scholars ask you about ibn taymiyah then you, if it's a, um, the, the best answer to give is that it's okay for scholars who uh, got good istidad and got lot knowledge they can read his books and they'll benefit from his books and for a lay person for a normal and average scholar they should not read his books what about ignorant layman criticizing ulama believing it to be enjoying good and forbidding evil so this is the point which i mentioned right in the beginning that khuturat al jarh wa ta'dil wa afatu ma it's not uh, uh, um, a lay person should uh, a layman should not be doing this at all why because he is not obligated uh, it's not uh, compulsory upon him to uh, criticize ulama when he doesn't know a person cannot criticize someone on a topic which he does not know about so if you didn't study any mantiq in your life you cannot go now and speak against uh, scholars in this, uh, so you are a scholar but you cannot criticize other scholars because you did not disc- um, uh, uh, delve in that field so all the more reason uh, a layman he cannot criticize a, another person and then he will be uh putting himself in this danger because if he is incorrect then on the day of qiyamah it's haqqullah fa inna fi ma'a haqqillah ta'ala wa rasulihi sallallahu alayhi wasallam haqqa adamiyyin so quickly now the three minutes of mine went so quickly the three minutes i have to take it to complete this chapter so now i saying wa ahsab um from now if you want to ask questions it's better to please rather ask on the group inshallah wa ahsab aba muhammad abdul rahman ibn abi hatim al razi min misli ma dhakarna hu khafi saying that about abdul rahman ibn abi hatim he was really fearful about this year fi marwinahu aw bulghnahu so we'll describe, uh, explain this year when you do muqaddama ibn salah why alama ibn salah would use the word wina and bulighna etc so he says that uh, yusuf ibn uh, uh, husayn al razi is the famous sufi he came uh, to him and uh, while he was reading his book al jarh wa ta'dil so he says how many of these people their conveyances have already reached jannah 100 or 200 years ago and you are making you are sitting talking about them and making ghiba about them so abdul rahman ibn abi hatim he burst out into tears he began to cry in the footnote as uh, sheikh abdul fatah bughdai quotes from alama dhahabi rahimahullah the reason why he started to cry is just out of his fear of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but of course the muhad- this one should preserve the ahadith by criticizing those who are weak wa bulighna annahu haditha wa huwa yaqra kitaba dhalika ala an-nas an yahya ibn ma'in so it is also reached as that uh, um when he was reading his book then he quoted from yahya ibn ma'in that yahya ibn ma'in said inna lanat'anu ala aqwam that we sometimes criticize narrators la'allahum hattu rihalahum fil jannah munzu aksar min 200 sanah 
So uh, probably the conveyances have already reached Jannah 200 years ago. And then Alam Adhabi, rahimahullah, he commented on this and said, probably it was a hundred years because uh, by the time of Yahya ibn Ma'in, 200 years have not even passed. So Fabaka Abdul Rahman, so Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Hatim, he burst out into tears, وَرْتَعَدَتْ يَدَاهُ and his hands began to shake Hatta سَقَطَ الْكِتَابُ مِنْ يَدِهِ So Sheikh Abdul Fatah Bukhudda now, he uh, comments on this here and says, مَنْ أَجَلِ هَذَا وَذَاكْ In light of all it has been discussed above, وَصُعُوبَةِ الشُّرُطْ فِي الْمُزَكِّينَ وَالْمُجَرِّحِينَ And the very stringent and difficult conditions for uh, the muzakkin, those who approve of narrators and those who criticize narrators He's saying the amount of experts, the number of experts who could criticize are very, very few. And they are much less compared to the overall number of muhaddithun and narrators. And narrators I say the number of narrators and muhaddithun, they go into thousands. Jahafil is the plural of the word jahfil, which means multitudes. So great multitudes, huge amount of muhaddithun. Saying as for uh, narrators, as for um, those who would criticize, they hardly even a thousand. While Jahabi Zatumin who may may attain judgment, the experts from amongst them, they would not even reach 200. And those were exceptional. The authorities of this were divinely uh, gifted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most definitely, they would hardly even reach a hundred. So you won't even get a hundred scholars who criticize narrators, but narrators are in the thousands and uh, so many, um, uh, uh, such a large amount of narrators. He's saying this year is proven. Like how this year becomes very apparent in the book of Alama Zahabi, Rahmullah, Zikro, Mayu Atamir Qawlu Fil Jirhi Wa Ta'adil, and the Jews of Alama Sakhawi, Al Mutakallimuna Fir Rijal, and you can see that both of these books are published with the tahkik of uh, Sheikh Abdul Fatah Abu Ghudda. Inshallah, we'll continue from you next week. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.